The wildest thing about all my toxic relationships is that forever hurt I am by them, I was never given a sorry. Nobody ever apologized to me for their abuse or abandonment. And if I call them up like I did my dad, I would either get gaslit into believing I hold on to the past, it did not happen, or that they hurt, they are so hurt, I'm hurt, that they can't talk anymore. The problem with this dynamic is that all these relationships were filled with sorries. They just came from me. Only three people have ever said, I say sorry too much. And the strange thing is none of them were my abusive father or toxic exes. They were strangers or a-hole acquaintances that thought they knew me enough to have me pegged. The problem is sometimes the people that most dislike you can give you a point of view that is true. Like bullies that told me I was fat and eat too much. Totally true. Right message, wrong messenger. Because their intention was to either humiliate me or teach me a lesson, but either way subdue me. Running through the halls of my collegiate, I bumped into my white savior professor. These are the liberal arts professors that hoist up the five students of color they have in their course as speakers to oppression. Mind you, we were all 19, overeating ramens and trying to figure out whether we fatally had to own and read a textbook to pass a class. Our minds were everywhere except for where others might place us in race, class, and gender because by the end of our teendom, we already knew where it was. Now we just wanted to figure out how to make sure our freshman 10-pound gain did not become our sophomore 20. Thus, when I bumped into him, I did not expect an op-ed on how I needed to be more liberated. It was a fleeting sorry, I said, to which he responded, You say sorry a lot. You You do not always need to be apologetic. I literally saw a white savior robe float from the heavens as gold hummingbird sung into his his, uh, ears. Look at you, freeing her. Anti-colonizer, that's what you are. It was such a personal, powerful read that came from the wrong deliverer at the wrong time and not necessarily would be realized until much later in my life. After all, I did bump into him. And I'm not grateful to people that tell me flaws I do not perceive in myself because those people believe shame is a method of freedom. Having your third period professor tell you that you're a sorry ward is just the right key to launch a young, impressionable girl into an existential crisis that was not needed before salsa night later that day. That moment always stood out to me as a truth that now I acknowledge, but also for its delivery. All my life, men have approached me for whatever reason with a sincere belief that I am unaware of who I am, and that is their privilege, to be so unaware of themselves that they thought they had the automatic right to tell me who I am and where I fit in their narrative. The truth is they saw my power before I did and felt they had the right to tell me why I was not using it or should not. I say this because a few years later, that same professor would confront and tell me he thought I gave him a bad review on Rate My Professor. The irony is I did not care about him enough to rate him, but he did care for himself enough to assume I did. Once again, self-unawareness is the privilege. So let's unpack. Um, so this professor, what I, what I always found so strange about that dynamic was it was so fleeting. I was walking and I, I literally ran into him. I'm sorry. And he's like, you say sorry a lot. And he, he had white savior complex and he meant it as, you know, you don't need to always apologize to the man. That's that system training. And at that moment, it just felt really big and symbolic and overarching for something that was just a bump on my way to class. And it's something that I've noticed with a lot of my toxic exes and with my dad, this kind of idea of I'm going to make you think you are somehow fragile towards yourself and make that appear like an act of kindness. Like he thought he was being kind and liberating to me. And in fact, he was being annoying and rude to me. I felt like I don't need to be saved. I don't want to be saved by you, especially by issues that either I don't have or I don't have in the ways you think, because I, the problem was not that I say sorry too much is that I live and attract and stay in relationships where I am never apologized to. And I give sorries, not because of bumping people into the hallway. I give sorries because I, I tell these men that they are using my existence to give them life. 
and it's breaking my heart. And if they really loved me, they would realize that, change the dynamic and start loving me back. Start an equal pair where we build each other. And one of the things about this professor that I hated is he loved to, he fed off of negative feelings, very similar to my dad. Just this kind of I remember like this trans girl threw a chair across the room. She was so angry because we were talking about LGBTQ plus um, topics. And this is, of course, liberal arts college. So it's like filthy rich white kids that think they're liberal or just didn't get into Harvard. Um, And he would bring up these topics and try to push buttons and open letters to teach white people, particularly privileged white, rich, privileged white people. uh, their power in terms of hurting and angering BIPOC people, LGBTQ plus members. And he would do that by making us hurt, by opening our wounds and making us realize that white privileged people didn't care. And I'm saying that in the dynamic of the room, because I think one of the hardest lessons I've had to learn in my life is that goodness, the essence of goodness is just so intuitively found. And it goes, it truly does go beyond race, religion, um, education, class. Like there's just some genuinely good people. And we're all raised to believe that if we stick to our race, if we stick to our gender, if we stick to this education, this class, we're going to find, we'd have more likelihood of finding good people. And I think now more than ever, that's just not true. I think now more than ever, the truth is what we always felt and at times acknowledged, especially via, you know, dogmatic figures like, dogmatic figures like Jesus, which is love is just love. It is so beyond any layers and labels, any checkboxes. You just know it when you see it. Kind of like how everybody knows Keanu Reeves is a good guy. (laughs) You know, we're just like anybody who hates Keanu. We're just like, there's something wrong with you. That guy's a sweetie. And the kind of like how everybody knew Diddy was not a good guy. We were like, "Mm, I don't trust that. He doesn't pay people. Um, And it just felt so heavy and so triggering. And you don't know me. You don't know me. And it was this, uh, the desire to be impressionable on me via his perception of my flaws felt so dirty. And then years later, he thought I left him a bad review. Like he really thought it was me. And I just, I don't care. I very, I don't even leave bad Yelp reviews to restaurants that are egregious like that. I care more about leaving a bad review at a restaurant than a professor. I probably enjoy the restaurant more, (laughs) but that always stood out to me. And I think that's one of the dangers uh, at times of white allyship or allyship in general. I think allyship has the tendency to believe it's it. It doesn't believe in reparations. It doesn't believe in materially replacing or making material access routes for what was stolen. And I say that because one thing that my father did was he not only failed to materially provide for me, he tortured me psychologically with that fact. I will never give you anything. You do not deserve anything. And he not only did that, but he took money from my mom. And he took money from me in not paying child support, but he literally took money from my mom for his other kids, for drugs. And that is so emotional, just on that experience alone. And I think what evil, oppressive people do, like my dad, or you want, if you want to say like white oppressors, any oppressor, is they convince themselves that material is material. I took material things. You don't emotionally feel it. Now we're obviously seeing that, you know, a homeless person, if they don't have a home, they feel horrible about it, right? But still, we don't do anything to kind of give them a home. And one of the things about white allyship that that I stay away with or allyship in general is just this belief that giving me permission to speak out and speak up on how badly history 
even to this present, has treated my people, has made me feel, has blocked me from my own material progress, let alone spiritual. That to them is a reparation. Just being allowed to say, a dog is a dog. And I have, I think one of the things that people often talk about with oppressive groups, and I said spiritual progression, you know, the whole idea is broke, being broke doesn't make you broken. And the truth is the whole point of making people broke is to make them broken. But you can spiritually progress beyond your material inability to progress. But it's tremendously hard and it's, it requires a lot of maintenance. You will have dark days if you don't have a buck. And a dollar makes me holla that came into my head, that honey boo boo quote. And I just, he enjoyed too much seeing the people in pain, in pain, all to feed this notion we already knew. Oppression exists. There is such a thing as classism, racism, sexism. Those stuff exists. Homophobia, the phobias, isms, that exists. And I don't know, I think we've reached a point of not only do we not question its existence, but we also don't question its pain and its painfulness. So his enjoyment of it was really to feed his own power. And my dad did the same thing to me. And I often say this, I think how individuals work is totally reflective of their communities and their histories and, or how they use either to justify and nurture their own nature. My dad loved power and he claimed it was because he lived such a powerless childhood. He loved to watch me cry and he claimed it was because he never felt wanted. And this man may have said he was uh, a white ally, that he recognized his privilege, but his privilege was that, to bring up topics that it's, it's arguable. If he's allowed to bring up those topics, you know, it's always divided, but to bring up topics with the intent of opening up wounds he couldn't close. That trans girl stayed crying for like three days. And yeah, I always think about that. I hate that manipulativeness, especially because it, 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 in their head, it's, it's the very reason they should have hero worship. Ugh, what an episode. Check out daddyrecovery.com and please listen to Business Class out May 24th. Follow me, follow me, follow me.